and medical or a medical practitioner who has the experience of at least one year in the practice of obstetrics and gynecology so we understand that all either of these conditions once it is fulfilled that person is one rmp so now up to 20 weeks of gestation the opinion of one rmp is enough up to 20 to 24 weeks of gestation we need to have the opinion of two rmps but beyond 24 weeks of gestation please remember beyond 24 weeks of gestation we will require the opinion of a medical board till now we were approaching the courts now there is no role of the courts and the medical boards can opine on the requirement for abortion and then also the method of abortion now under the amended rules so there is one more thing that i would like to talk about that an additional category of provider has been added that is for termination up to nine weeks with medical methods so any rmp with experience in practice of ops gynae at any hospital for three months or training with performance of 10 cases of mtp by medical abortion under supervision of rmp can provide mtp up to nine weeks of gestation so this is a very very important aspect so hence i will reiterate the requirement of rmp for various gestation now up to nine weeks of pregnancy the rmps who are who can provide in addition to these four that is the pg one year practice six months out surgency or 25 cases of mtp are one who has any experience at a hospital for three months in ops gynae along with 10 cases of mtp by medical abortion so the idea is that up to nine weeks even person who has provided 10 cases of MTP by MMA under the supervision of RMP can provide medical abortion. This is again to increase the access to medical abortion. So this is very, very important change which has happened. Up to 12 weeks, we have all the four categories where previously mentioned 25 cases of MTP who has assisted of which five has done been done independently. And the rest of course is PG, six months or one year so this is up to 12 weeks so this 25 cases of mtp who has assisted is only up to 12 weeks now what happens beyond 12 weeks is this person who was eligible up to 12 weeks by assisting in 25 mtp is not eligible for second trimester abortion so the second trimester abortion can only be provided by a postgraduate or a practitioner who has six months of experience in uh, ops gynae or at least one year of practice in ops gynae so these uh, are there and of course this with the same competency between 20 to 24 weeks we will need two rmps so the major difference is that first trimester and second trimester and within the first trimester you have up to nine weeks and up to 12 weeks so this is something which has been added and very very important now beyond 24 weeks please remember that beyond 24 weeks the MTP can only be provided by a postgraduate or those who have at least one year of practice in ops gynae. But this procedure has to be approved by a medical board who says that it, it can be done, it should be done, and it will be done under supervision at a place which is approved for second uh, 20 to 24 weeks of period of gestation. The medical boards should have a gynecologist, pediatrician, radiologist, uh, the powers of medical board. So the medical board. So once a case between after 24 weeks is referred to a medical board, the medical board has to look into the case, the details of the case, then decide whether to allow and deny the termination of pregnancy beyond 24 weeks, keeping in mind the safety of the woman and whether the fetal malformation has a substantial risk. And the specialist can be nominated to the board by the chairperson of the board. For example, a pediatric cardiologist can be nominated to the board if it's a significant problem to the fetal cardiac heart, fetal heart. Now, let me tell you uh, the present status is that there are 178 boards which are already available and the list of which would be available very soon on the Foxy website. The state boards have to be approached. A person in a particular state has to approach that particular state board only. And that board will refer that will consider the case to give a decision and also ensure that the procedure is performed timely. So the functions are to examine the woman and her report, 
provide the opinion of the medical board in the form d regarding termination whether you can undergo termination or you cannot undergo termination and if you have decided that this lady can undergo termination the medical board is also to carry out safely all the with safety precaution uh, with appropriate counseling within 5 days of the receipt of the request so the termination also needs to be carried out under the supervision of the medical board so uh, the functional medical board in every state some of them are already functional the people who are in their separate states they can also approach the state uh, the state associations to understand what is the list and which will soon be available on the foxy website that what is the list of your medical boards so i think i will stop now and i'll be more than happy to take the questions uh, regarding this uh, so and after this thank you very much ladies uh, so uh, some of the uh, i think it is 354 i'll just take two minutes to answer a few questions if there are any uh, can i request uh, dr surinder kaur to please mute volume down kar low volume ye na fir sunna nahi jyoti utar dena and fir disconnect ho jana ha fir dobara gadbad ho jayegi nahi kuch nahi fir low volume fir bye bye yes so uh, earlier we so dr richa has a question that we used to get level 2 or tfa scan before 20 weeks can we now order it at being 20 weeks or up to 24 weeks as a routine so dr richa i think this is a a little of a problematic question because between 18 to 20 weeks we are able to easily identify a lot of things so i would not routinely say uh, or change guidelines at the present time but yes if there is some late evolving malformation that has been detected it can be referred to the board uh in case of congenital malformation do we need opinion of specialist like cardiologist uh yes definitely we do it like you know even now in our institute also before we plan a termination of pregnancy between 20 to 24 weeks it's really important that we have all of these things documented with the, uh, the with the prognosis the possibility of intra intra uterine therapy the possibility of postnatal therapy so all of these should be documented uh in case of a minor 20 weeks with consent for two uh, two uh, rmps poxo at applies or not yes so this is a question which is often asked please understand that poxo act is there for anybody who's less than 18 years of age and it will be there so as a facility as a provider healthcare provider we need to notify the authorities in case of a lady who is a minor but we cannot refuse abortion we cannot refuse abortion and in this particular case the minor can come not necessarily with a parent or a guardian the minor can come with an adult who's consenting to be with her and give the consent so this is something that we need to understand poxo stays mtp stays we have to take both together so the pox in any lady who's a minor and you are doing a procedure or you have seen a patient we need to inform as per law at the same time it is our duty to provide abortion along with uh, the in the presence of a, an adult who is there to you know write uh, sign the consent so beyond uh, for termination of pregnancy beyond 24 weeks out of uh, rape or incest i think um, that's not safe and currently it is only up to 24 weeks so again maybe in that situation you'll have to take the legal course so uh, that's a question uh, indoor tickets are computerized so even our indoor tickets are computerized and we write the mtp number on the indoor ticket so that is very much possible so please ask your authorities to do it uh contraception failure is an indication uh rape victim i have already talked medical board as i said uh, please uh, keep on uh, you know we'll be circulating the list on the foxy website in consultation with government of india uh, rape victim about 20 weeks of gestation so between to 20 to 24 you can uh, go uh, you know you have a documentation you can go for abortion okay so in case of an uh, uh, minor the consent has to be taken so what what should be done in the case of a minor the consent has to be taken by an adult not necessarily a parent or a guardian so please remember this and for poxo we need to inform the authorities as soon as possible uh, so i think uh, 
that is all for the current session. So please keep putting your questions in the chat and we'll uh, take it later on. Now for the second session, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Basab. Dr. Basab, are you here? Dr. Basab? Uh, Dr. Krishnendu. Yes, Dr. Bus Basad is here. So, uh, sir, I would request you to carry on with the next session, please. Thank yes, you. thank you. Thank you, Pardon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, just finished clinic. So, I'll just start screen share. Hmm. Sorry. Yes, that's what updates in technology. Fine. So a very good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you for joining Respectful Abortion Care um, TOT series. So here we are trying to um, trying to uh, trying to uh, show you what the modules generally are. What are the what are the areas which we are going to cover here? And the same we expect you to use when you would be uh, doing the same training at the next level. So module 3A, this is safe abortion updates from technology. Over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll guide you through the existing guidelines that we have in the different technologies used for abortion, both medical as well as surgical, and pre-abortion assessment, the medical methods of abortion, which are currently recommended or the recent changes which have happened in the FIGO and WHO and the surgical methods of abortion. So whenever you think of abortion, very similar to when you think of violence against women, think orange, because a lot of this is a lot of orange on your screens. Netherlands will be happy and this orange from safe abortion to medical management of abortion, everything can you can download uh, from the WHO website. And this is uh, the, this has got very uh, substantial information about what the recent uh, updates and um, thought processes is. On the very similar lines of WHO, the Indian government and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare have got out some uh, things where adaption of WHO safe abortion guidelines in India to people who may think about a, a more national context to the same thing, will get the same information from, uh, again, as downloads from the uh, Ministry of Health website. So from 2012, when the first safe abortion um, orange book was made till 2019, 18 was where the medical methods was made. And then 2019, the WHO consolidated guidelines on self-care intervention for health, which isn't relevant for us. But at the same time, those are the different publications made at different times. Already, uh, Dr. Apanna has covered with you the, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare National Guidelines on Safe Abortion, what rules have changed recently, uh, the, the law and the rules have changed and now the MTP Amendment uh, 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 2021 is the new terminology which is used and uh, we should all be updated with the changes which have been made and what, that is one of the different purposes of this um, series is to make sure that people know what the changes are and adopt them in their clinical management of patients. So all guidelines have three key areas in management of abortion. And this is, this is pretty obvious, but at the same time, it's important when you put it into perspective and when you put it on a slide it, and when you try to, uh, like to follow it, in, in your own clinical practice, then it definitely adds more value and meaning. So pre-abortion care, when a woman comes to you in your clinic seeking an abortion, you would need to talk to her about uh, different things. And that's what we'll be discussing in the beginning. And then the different methods in which she can undergo the procedure which she has opted for. And then what happens after that, you can't leave her in the lurch. There is some other discussion to happen. And why was she here in the first place? And what are the things which can be done so that she does is not come into the same situation again. So pre-abortion assessment and counseling would involve the detailed history taking. And now this is normal for any patient who walks into the clinic and this is no different. General physical and pelvic examination would be an integral part of any, uh, any, any woman in general. And here there is a more trust on this because uh, as we will be discussing later, uh, most of the uterine size assessment or how big the uterus is to find out the gestational age is uh, stressed by the WHO uh, to be done on um, 
by pelvic examination and not uh, and uh, by the history taking and not just depending on a uh, ultrasonography. So the ultrasonography is reserved later in case a person cannot as, uh, assess pelvically uh, pel uh, by pelvic examination. Either the woman is too obese or there are more additions or there is some other difficulty in doing the examination. Lab and other investigations come later. What are the minimum investigations required? We'll come to that. And then the decision making, information on abortion procedures, and counseling. So, pregnancy dating by physical examination, by manual pelvic and abdominal examination is stressed on. A lot of us uh, do not always examine patients in clinic. I think that's not a good trend here. In this sort of a case, it has to be done because that is the best way in which you can assess the size of the uterus and then decide on what, whether, what methods you can offer her. After 12 weeks, it's, it's for uh, the generalization. We know that the uterus rises out of the pelvis and then you can feel it per abdomen. So sometimes uh, if it's a breastfeeding woman or a woman with irregular periods, we know that you get surprises when she comes with, uh, sorry, when she comes with um, a two month amenorrhea and irregular periods, suddenly you see that um, the uh, abdomen is the 16 week size uterus and that's not unusual. So there are cases where uh, uh, sometimes again, it may be wrong dates, sometimes it may be even a fibroid. We don't know. Sometimes it may be an ovarian cyst uh, lying on the side. So there are different reasons why you may get um, uh, something which is not matching to your clinical data, but that's something which we should be all aware of. So a uterus which is smaller than size uh, uh, could be a woman who's not pregnant at all. Then you go back to see whether the pregnancy test was done at all. Inaccurate menstrual dating. And uh, of course, if it's an ectopic pregnancy or if there was already an abortion, then it may be smaller. If it's larger than expected, again, you always, the old classical teaching is go by wrong dates is the first. So inaccurate menstrual dating, uh, menstrual uh, multiple gestation and fibroids, molar pregnancy. So pre-abortions investigations, it is routine lab tests are not a prerequisite for abortion services. That's a big loud uh, the message there. Tests that may be performed as per uh, individual risk factors on the risk of physical examination would be first a pregnancy test, of course, if it's not confirmed. So if a woman comes where she's not very sure whether the, there were two lines on the urine test, then you may always do it again. Uh, hemoglobin or a hemocrit for suspected anemia. Nowadays with the mask, it may be difficult to see the tongue, but you can still see the conjunctiva. And uh, maybe the, after the COVID <coughs> passes away, you may see the tongue to find out if you have a suspicion of anemia, which is there. <coughs> Sorry prevalent in seven out of 10 women in our population. And then uh, you may need to uh, consider doing a hemoglobin. Uh, uh, RH negative testing, uh, or where RH uh, immunoglobulin is available for RH negative women. I think this is an important thing because, um, and it makes me sometimes wonder with so much over the counter um, uh, medical abortion happening, whether any RH women who are not um, just checking their uh, blood group and are having the abortion done, how much of them sensitization is really taking place. We don't know, but it's, it's important to have the blood uh, group uh, known for a woman who's undergoing an abortion, medical or surgical. HIV testing, counseling, especially if she's getting admitted. STI screening, I think it's, again, it's an opportunistic uh, idea because as we know in India, a lot of things uh, do not normally, uh, health checkups do not normally come to women. So when she's come for a uh, missed period and an abortion, you can also check that she may has some other requirements like STI needs to be taken care of that can be looked into. So ultrasound loud and clear is not necessary unless to diagnose a pregnancy not certain or suspecting an ectopic or a missed abortion. So there must be a reason to do a sonography. That's the WHO guidelines, loud and clear. In the private sector, many of us would do a sonography, but that is not a recommendation and it's loud and clear. It needs to be, cannot be replacing uh, examination. Pre-abortion counseling. So thoughts about terminating the pregnancy, reasons for terminating. Often we send patients home for a couple of days to think about it, especially a woman um, who, uh, uh, who's just newly married and has got the pregnancy maybe in six months after marriage where she wasn't planning it. So you can give her some time to think and that uh, if she really wants to continue or go ahead with the decision to terminate. Uh, and uh, then they will come back and then they think about it and then they decide on what they want to do. The reasons for terminating, of course, it has to go according to the MTP Act. It can't be just a desire. It has to be something else. So failure of contraception 
or uh, affecting um, the mental physical health would be something coming up there. So, uh, um, so it's the information which needs to be given, a very important question which comes out, which we don't have a very clear answer, is uh, how much will an abortion affect your future fertility? The correct answer is that it's a very little chance of abortion affecting future fertility if it is done early, if it is done under uh, proper settings. Uh, there is a very less, less chance. Now trying to translate that into percentage is a difficult thing, but uh, if you want to translate into percentage, it's uh, usually a less than 1% chance that uh, in a, if an abortion takes place, there will be an infection where the tubes will get blocked or she'll get PID, which way she'll have later subfertility or dysmenorrhea or in, uh, other pelvic pain. So those chances are quite less in most cases, but at the same time, it cannot be ruled out at any point of time and something which has to be done. So it's abortion is not a, uh, it should not be a regular feature. You have to you stress on the use of effective contraception and that is, uh, no, this is no substitute for that. The importance of a trade provider performing the procedure for safety is there available methods of abortion need to be discussed. So we need to bring up the issues in front of her and she has to decide. So when you're talking about medical and surgical, medical at the um, look may think something simpler, something uh, something easier, but at the same time, um, if, she, uh, if she already is anemic and you're uncertain about the number, amount of bleeding which she may have, then she may opt for a surgical abortion. That's one where the bleeding would be more under control and less possibly at the same time. You may have a chance to give an IV iron shot at the same time. So those are all options are there. And then uh, if she wants to be more certain about it, then you need to bring up the percentage chances of success at the uh, gestation age she is for medical versus surgical and then give her a choice which she will take. Suppose she doesn't want to have seven to 10 days of bleeding. And she just wants to have two or three, then she's better off possibly having a surgical than a medical and different other things. So I think it's an important to balance the different uh, pros and cons of each or the ways that each of them work and at different gestation ages and then let the uh, lady and the couple decide. Risks and warning signs associated with any abortion method is important. Uh, if nothing it goes without risks, so that's something which is needs to be highlighted. The risks during the abortion, risks after the abortion, it may be incomplete, it may be uh, it we may need to be done again, and uh, there are several continuing pregnancies. There's different other things, and the red flag signs of what things where she needs to seek emergency attention. Without contraception, of course, it has to be said that she can get pregnant again. And, and I think at every understand we understand that at every clinic visit, we need to give more information because there is a chance that this patient may not keep on coming back for the uh, regular three visits which were uh, highlighted and which we will be discussing later. So when she can she resume her normal activities, when she can resume sexual intercourse and all needs to be there. Informed written consent, we can't go without that. The consent has to be taken. I think we're now fairly clear that any health medical, uh, any healthcare provider, uh, um, uh, so a registered medical uh, practitioner can uh, uh, can, uh, can uh, write or can um, uh, prescribe a medical abortion, but they need to have a, a link to a center where surgical abortion is done and that has to be displayed in the clinic. So clinic, clinical management of abortion, less than 12 weeks, um, you can have mepiprostol and misoprostol, misoprostol only, or vacuum aspiration more than 12 weeks. Again, instead of vacuum, you have dilatation and curettage, and uh, that's more than 12 weeks. Uh, a lot of this uh, only misoprostol is written, not because it doesn't, uh, it's in, especially in some countries where mepiprostol is banned or mepiprostol is not available. So uh, in, in, in a setting it's like ours where you have both Possibly it is much more prudent to use both rather than using a misoprostol only regime. So mifepristol and misoprostol would be your uh, choice in India as it presently stands because both of the drugs are available. But there are some countries in the world where they are not and that's where misoprost only comes into the picture. So government uh, of India recommendations, medical only till nine weeks. So that's still the time you would be uh, allowed. And uh, so that would be a uh, mifibrestone 200 milligrams, wait for 24 to 48 hours, 800 micrograms of misoprostol, that is four 200 microgram tablets, sublingual buckle or vaginal, and uh, up to seven weeks, again, the same thing, uh, abortion till nine weeks. 
So medical methods of abortion or surgical methods of abortion could be manual vacuum aspiration or electronic vacuum aspiration and medical methods. So what are the options we have and how does it go? I think all of us are fairly acquainted to this that mefepristone is an antiprogestogen. It inhibits the action of progestogen, interferes with continuation of pregnancy. So once you give this and sensitize the uterus and then you follow it by a misoprostol um, and um, a PGE1 analog, then it uh, leads to cervical softening contractions and expulsion of the products. So this is the normal thing. The gap between the two, it's 24 to 48 hours, which is now very clear. Initially, they used to say 36, but 24 to 48, it works almost the same way if that's a gap between the two uh, medicines. Uh, the advantage of tab it's, um, it can be, there's a it's stable at room temperature is important. It's cost effective, easy to handle, store, and uh, it's used in combination in the combi pack which often is what we most of us prescribe with the mefepristone and the misoprostol are all together. Again, we administer in different forms and each one has different pharmaceutical, pharmacokinetics when you, ad, uh, when you advise, uh, when you have the different routes, but and uh, reduces the need for surgical, uh, surgical, um, skilled surgical abortion providers means your dilatation becomes, of course, easy. All of us know that. And we use it in different settings where you need to dilate the cervix before you have to do a surgery. So equipment, sterilization, anesthesia, useful in low resource settings, of course. So protocols for mitoprostol and misoprostol, this we said. So if it's a, and if it's a negative blood, a negative group woman and you are giving it to her, then an anti-D of a 50 or 100, whichever the lower dose is available, you can give her if she is negative on the day when you're giving mifeprostone. So that is day one. Day three, that's again 20 or 48 hours apart, let's say up to seven weeks, uh, 400 micrograms of misoprostol. This is from the government of India. Uh, in the, in the uh, uh, WHO, they say 800 throughout. But here up to seven, they've written 400 and up seven to nine, it's 800. And, and uh, some of the additional things which all of us do offer is analgesics during the time of the expulsion. We very clearly tell them there'll be a few hours of pain, very similar to what they have during periods or maybe a little more than that for which you can give them some sort of analgesics which does not interfere with the abortion process. And then antiemetics, which usually you give them an hour or two before having the misoprostol so that they don't uh, vomit it out and so that it works properly and contraception, which can be taken from day three, especially if you're taking oral contraceptive pills, that's one of the different options which you can adopt. Within day 15, follow up to just, and, and, and to explain to them the bleeding can last from seven to 10 days. Usually if it doesn't last longer other than that, then it's usually done. You don't need to do a sonography to check everything is clear. I think those are the thoughts which were there a few years ago, but now it's not there anymore. But contraception of course can be used at different times and it has to be uh, stressed. So how are the different routes of mesoprostol? Yes. Yes, you can give them uh, the swallowing is the easiest way, but it works better in the buccal or sublingual. And so that is typically 30 minutes uh, between the gum and cheek in buccal with, uh, and sublingual under the tongue. And uh, I think a lot of people ask, is it, a, is it a mouth dissolving tablet? And the correct answer is no, it doesn't dissolve in the mouth. It actually tastes horrible, but at the same time, it's the best, uh, it's the best way it will, be, it will act. So once you say that it acts better this way, then I think most people act Accept it. Sometimes if people say it's too long, 30 minutes, then maybe 15 minutes and then swallow it with a glass of water. But the beginning idea is that it works better in this buccal and sublingual than vaginal and oral. But at the same time, if the people, if it's, if people are too touchy, they can always swallow it. But this is worse, better when you're talking about seven to nine weeks. More fevers and, uh, and chills than with the vaginal loop if you keep it subbuccal and sublingual. Yes, this is again a part of the um, side effects of misoprostol. Um, usually with a sing with 800 microns, you may not see it in everybody, but there is a chance that it may uh, you may need to discuss it when you're giving it. So some sort of a febrile episode, chills, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, which may be which may be there as a temporary uh, side effect which usually does not last very long, but you can always talk about it. So just to a pictorial representation of where the buccal and sublingual tablets are. So here's your buccal between your uh, tooth teeth and your uh, cheek. And here is the below the tongue is your sublingual where it's nicely kept there. So WHO drug regimens, dosage schedule for medical abortion. Again, as I said, uh, the difference which you saw in the previous slide when we said up to seven, four hundred, seven to nine, eight hundred doesn't uh, uh, doesn't uh, hold here. So here, the one which is suggested by 
the WHO has induced abortion less than 12 weeks, 200 uh, and one to two days later, 800 um, buckle per, per vaginal or sublingual. Huh? That is how the thing is. So buckle per vaginal or sublingual, Mr. Prost, 800 micrograms. And um, so vaginal bleeding for two weeks is normal. Such bleeding can last up to 45 days in rare cases. Nobody will wait for that long, of course. But if you say seven to 10 days, maximum two weeks, most people will agree. And you really don't need to do a sonography to check whether it's done or not. If she has persistent bleeding on and off, then obviously there's a chance that this incomplete, there's retained products of conception. And usually that's sonography, but all you need to do it, you need to do it, you should do it after 15 days. So not before that. So in the initial parts of medical methods of abortion, I remember MMA in the, in the maybe 10 years ago, not people used to do sonographies at seven days and 10 days and do uh, check um, um, uh, check it, uh, a suction curatage of the retained products and that's really not recommended you can't wait for 15 days unless she's having heavy bleeding and where she's having um, uh, maybe the hemoglobin is coming down provision of mms services services should be available at the primary care level with references with referral systems required uh, for all higher levels additional services we already mentioned that so in case she needs some more uh, psychology or counseling service, I think that's something important. When you're talking about respectful abortion care, I think it's so important to understand this part that to be, these women are women in need. And uh, it's not that they just love to have an abortion done. They are in a, they are in a tight position. They have not used contraception, let us put all, they may have used, but it hasn't worked for them. And that is the reason why they are here. So it's not abortion is something that they love to have, or abortion is something that they've come here for doing. It's something we you understand that they are in a sticky position and you need to really help them out. So respectful abortion care is something very paramount here. And here the psychological, the impact that abortion has on a woman is something which is so underplayed and something which we as clinicians have to keep in mind. So it's not important to say, why didn't you use contraception? Why didn't you use, why didn't you have your pills? Why didn't you take the injection? Why didn't you uh, use a condom? I think that's not the approach which we should have. We should have a more sensitive approach that it's all right, that it's okay, it hasn't gone your way, but we will try to help you out so that the next time uh, you don't come into the situation which you are here now. So, uh, so abuse support services, so that's another uh, big, uh, big uh, arena. In case he's a, it's an unmarried lady, in case he's, um, you think of some other problems, then definitely you need to have that support where you need to know there's lines which to, to help her. Uh, any other medical service, especially STIs. Iron tablets for anemia, very, again, an opportunity here you have, and pain medication, emotional support, that's what we said. Follow-up care, routine follow-up care is not necessary following an uncomplicated medical abortion, usually that 1-3-15 regime, which the government of India did, um, uh, lay out in the guidelines a few years ago, um, always and clinical practice and does not always hold, we know that, but it's a good idea to make sure that it's complete and make sure she's taken care of after the uh, abortion and she uses a, a proper method of abortion, method of thing, uh, method of uh, uh, contraception and birth care family plan. A follow-up visit seven to 14 days after the procedure may be offered to provide contraception counseling, especially if she has not, or emotional services. Thing. And so again, this comes in the respectful abortion care. You need to make sure she's not uh, left there, that she has the, some follow-up done and she is there. So follow-up care, assess women's recovery and ask for any signs or symptoms of ongoing pregnancy. Review any available medical records and referral documents. Ask about any symptoms experienced since the procedure. Perform a focused physical examination for any complaints and if uh, look at a fertility goals and need of contraception. The summary of this part, which is medical methods, is a physical pelvic examination. Don't do only a sonography. That's not right. Uh, confirm eligibility. That's so important. Give her... Uh, uh, negative mothers give her anti-D, uh, 200 mifepristone, return for misoprostol after two days, sometimes you give them all together, but give her, of course, helplines where she can go in case she has a problem. So that is something. So three percent women may exhale completely uh, with mifepristone, but misoprostol schedule should be complete. I think this is something which we standardly use in our practice in case we don't you have to say that that in well, nevertheless however there is three to five percent people have bleeding after mifepristone or maybe more people have bleeding but uh, you should con continue with the course and then sublingual buccal vaginal last is oral observe for four hours painkillers of course and contraception options and the main period of bleeding eight to 13 days that's what we said the side effects of the medication and if it's an excess bleeding 
bleeding pain, fever, then they need to report early. 75% women are bought within four to six hours of the misoprost. So what you need to do uh, by day 15, if she doesn't have a uh, pelvic exam is showing your completion of abortion. Well, yes, you will see that the os is open, but that doesn't happen all the time. She may have intermittent bleeding, which is heavy, for which you may need to do a imaging technique to find out whether there's a retained products. Contraception options, of course, would have been discussed by that time. If they were not, then there's another chance. And also to tell them that their immediate return to fertility, which is so important because the, sometimes they don't... Either it doesn't, they forget or they conveniently forget or you forget to tell them, but it has to be told. So ultrasound only if examination doesn't confirm a completion of sonography. This is something which the WHO very strongly says. So side effects and complications, uh, pain, respectful, non-judgmental communication, verbal support. Ibuprofen is the painkiller of choice. Persistent pain, you need to look at other things, ectopic infections, other things. Uh, nausea, vomiting, usually cell phone. You can give them a couple of tablets that will be save a few phone calls, diarrhea, and infection. So action for failure, incomplete MMA. So uh, if it's failure, you have an uh, option of repeating. You have an option of vacuum aspiration. Usually most people go for a surgical procedure. And if it's incomplete, then you have a chance of repeating the misoprostol again, 800 the same way. And if that clears it, fine. Otherwise you offer for a surgical. And if she's already heavily bleeding, then you need to do a surgical because uh, it, it may need to get sorted out early. So excessive bleeding PV, um, what is that described as? So it's important to know what is defined as excessive bleeding PV, soaking two pads in an hour for two consecutive hours would be defined as excessive bleeding PV, two pads in an hour for two hours. So bleeding decreases over time, that's fine. We will wait for a look at her vitals and blood bleeding. Continue. Uh, uh, if it doesn't settle down, watch your vital signs. If the POCs in the cervical canal, they need to be removed. And uh, if the woman stabilizes and the pain reduces, then of course, vitals and bleeding PV for one more hour, and then you can discharge us. This is the uh, this is the evaluation of a woman who is admitted in a clinic, of course, or has come to an outpatient department, and then she's got excessive bleeding PV. What all do you need to do? The ultrasound would be indicated if the minimum uh, decidual bits which often are there then you can wait and watch especially if she's not having heavy bleeding but if there are if there is uh, enough to there there's a different options there's one is a surgical option one is a, again a repeat medical option and uh, then is of course if there's nothing happened and then of course we have to go for a surgical option Recording and reporting, then we have the form C. I think people should not forget to fill it. I think the MTP committee of FOXI has been doing wonderful work in trying to create awareness of, of all of uh, the different forms which are available. Form C, consent form, form 1, 2, 3, which are very important to be filled by different people at the time of this uh, procedure. Methods of first trimester abortion, uh, surgical methods. We'll just finish with this, MVA and uh, EVA. So manual vacuum aspiration and an electronic vacuum aspiration. So vacuum aspiration is a recommended treatment up to 12 weeks, and um, it is one of the safest methods, and it should not be completed by sharp curators. I think that's something which again goes by habit. And a lot of us as doctors, we don't, we find very difficult to change habits. So if you're using a curate for your lifelong, you really will not be um, changing into an MBA, though there's a lot of evidence to suggest this is something which is definitely much more uh, safer in evacuating a uterus than the sharp curate. But uh, it is, uh, it's, uh, there are several advantages of manual vacuum aspiration can be used in multiple settings without electricity. I pass over the last two decades has done an enormous amount of work in this field and uh, they have uh, the cannulas now are designed as 8 mm for eight weeks, 10 mm for 10 weeks, so that less, um, uh, be, uh, so that uh, even if you have other healthcare providers, we can also help in uh, finding them. And then the, we have the electric vacuum aspiration where there's electronic manipulation of the, of the vacuum. Vacuum. Cervical priming, I think that's something which all of us do recommended oral. Um, in the first trimester, cervical priming can be done by oral. Mifepristone, 200 mg, 24 to 40 years hours in advance, but most of us use misoprostol, 400 micrograms sublingually, two to three hours before the procedure is something which uh, can be used. And if it's used, Dr. Malati, you are uh, knowingly or unknowingly putting your... Um, uh, um, making some marks on the screen. So uh, uh, 400 micrograms administered vaginally three hours prior to the procedure at 11 area tent. I think that's not used anymore. Pain management plan for the vacuum aspiration procedure, the important component of quality uh, abortion care. 
reducing pain and anxiety and the form, uh, two components of pain, non-pharmacological and pharmacological, non-pharmacological pain management, providing psychological support, explaining each uh, step to the woman in advance, performing the procedure gently and smoothing and encouraging the woman to relax and breathe deeply. Uh, pharmacological uh, pain uh, management plan, so you give anxiolytics, uh, general anesthesia comes later, of course, but um, uh, diazepam is one of the options, four to six hours. You have side effects of disorientation, dizziness. Um, then you have cervical dilatation. Local anesthesia generally works best. Uh, lignocaine is good for uh, procedures. And if it's a longer procedure, then you need to give something more and analgesics, ibuprofen. So everybody will get all these slides. So you can definitely go through this before you take the discussion forward. The steps of MVA. I think that's very important. We have it in one slide. You close the valve buttons, create the vacuum, uh, ensure pain control is given and ask the woman to empty her bladder, perform a cervical, um, sorry, perform a cervical, sorry, um, antiseptic uh, uh, preparation, administer the paracervical block at uh, three o'clock, nine o'clock, dilate the cervix and insert the cannula and uh, suck out the suction of the contents, withdraw the cannula one to two centimeters from the fundus inside the uterine cavity so you can get, rotate the cannula in 10, two o'clock position with smooth, gentle motion, release the vacuum button on the aspiration so the things will come into the collection. See that the signs of uterine are empty when you have a red or pink foam without the tissue passing through the cannula, gritty sensation over the surface of the uterus, cervix gripping the cannula. We, we all know this, but it's good to put it into uh, uh, points and writing it, and it's, that's a good point of training. Uterus contracting around the cannula, increase uterine cramping. So inspection the tissue is a part of the procedure, and uh, concurrent procedures would be contraception if there's something if she wants to have an IUC inserted. If you have counseled her on that, a post abortal IUC insert, insertion is very uh, well accepted nowadays. And of course, instruments need to be uh, clean. The post procedure care after the surgical evacuation is done, we need to monitor her for complications, see that there's no heavy bleeding pain. She may leave the facility whenever she is stable, usually a couple of hours, usually would do depending on the anesthesia which has been given. If it is general, then she may need a few more hours. Ensure that the woman has all necessary information and medication prior to leaving the facility. Document all the outcome in the card. So after care, uh, managing of abortion complications, incomplete uh, infection. So if, in case there are problems, then that needs to be managed. And I think that's, again, important in respectful abortion care, more hand-holding of the patient and to understand that she's, uh, she may have some issues which needs sorting out after the procedure, which somebody has to be there to help her. So some helplines, some sort of guidance is important. Provision of contraception information of a contraceptive counseling. I think the important to understand that irrespective of however the good we want of the patient, there are some patients who will not use any contraceptive method, uh, however many times you talk to them, and they would uh, and come back again for repetitive uh, abortions. So I think it's important to understand this is we can take it as a failure of ourselves rather than a failure of the patient that uh, she's not listening. So there will be some patients who will not listen, but at the same time, we cannot blame them. There's no coercion. If you take an IOCD, that, that, that does not exist in respectful abortion care. So assessment of any sexual and reproductive health needs that requires additional care. Uh, no routine uh, follow-ups there. So summarizing this entire talk, India has made historic progress in improving access to safe abortion. We have reduced abortion-related mortality in the last decade, but uh, we, uh, there's not much has changed technological update in the last decade. Uh, as provided, it is, uh, it is up to us to ensure safety and quality, especially in context of the amended law. And along with safety, we need to focus on respectful abortion services, which is all this is about. Every client, public or private, has an opportunity to inform, educate, and equip with proper information on contraception and counseling. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I'll stop sharing. I'll just let, say, check the chat. If there's some questions which have come, let us just run through them. Um, I think I'm not sure where Dr. Aparna finished, but uh, is it necessary to inform police in case of minor? Of course it is, because that's a, the POXO Act will come in, then that is absolutely a different discussion. And I'll really in, into, in Dr. Vidu has asked, Dr. Anju has asked, Dr. Sudesh has asked, and I think that's a different discussion, a different day, but this is not the discussion today. But POXO Act exists and we all need to 
inform authorities whenever there is a less than eight minor at your clinic for a missed abortion. Is it safe to take the consent of a random person? Uh, we don't know who random, what it means, because uh, you don't know uh, the person who the, uh, the person uh, like whoever comes with her or claims to be her guardian is something which you need to assume you will not go into the details of who has come with her but you can write it make it write it down do we need both parents or single parents for consent for a minor um, i think a guardian will do and that is something which is there for the procedure but the information needs to be given do we need to have an adult yes uh, other forms e and d available i'm not sure e and d we're we'll talking about c one two three how many sessions are there today? There are sessions, uh, I'm sorry, we're overshooting, but there's another three sessions left. What is the program schedule for today? I thought it was distributed. How do you get the WHO guidelines book? Just um, uh, click on the internet WHO safe abortion guidelines. You'll get everything. Four sessions today, forms will be detailed. Uh, that's uh, up on now there. Uh, if patient comes with positive test only after two to three days overdue, no final ultrasound, how to proceed with termination? Well, you don't need to have always finding an ultrasound. So two to three days overdue, obviously you'll have ultrasound will be nothing, but then you'll have to proceed with uh, termination the normal way. Again, you ask her what she wants, medical, surgical, respectful abortion care, all thing. Case of previous order to Caesar, what is the dose of mifibus? is nothing different in second trimester. Second trimester, I think we didn't uh, discuss, but um, there are, uh, I think again, the very clear WHO guidelines depending on, uh, it's a little more streamlined than what it used to be before, about well, how much to use it. Previous one or two seasons, yes, there's nothing different. You don't need to give, but you need to be, of course, more cautious like anyone. We all are aware of the chance of scar rupture and the few anecdotal evidence we have, but at the same time, you have to be careful when you're having scarred uterus for uh, termination in the second trimester. It, it goes beyond uh, saying. Uh, any role of injection methogen or carbopros during MBA? Um, I think some people do use it, and I'm not sure that there's no recommended guidelines, but I think for stopping bleeding, you can use, though it may not be as effective as a postnatal case normally. POXO, of course, is important. Uh, um, service cannot be denied. I think uh, uh, Priya has said it right that you need to continue giving the services, need to inform the authorities, but services cannot be denied, and that's so important in um, uh, respectful abortion care. A rural area can we give MM, uh, MMA to patient in rural area? Of course, you can give, but again, as we said, you need to have a, uh, a, a sort of a, a chart very clearly written and has a problem where she needs uh, surgical services where will you will be able to give it. So that uh, that that uh, information has to be up and clear uh, in the clinic so that uh, it is uh, very clear. So you can give MMA to a patient in a remote location, but uh, means I don't think a remote location means you have to be there but she has to know a place where she has to go. So I don't think MMA over telemedicine, we'll have to discuss that. That's another one. Guardian, concentration, not parent. I think that's very clear. See, we can uh, give methanemic acid as analgesic. Yes, we can. WHO guidelines, SHRA, sure. Thanks, uh, Priya. And uh, Parneet Kaur for an adult woman. Her consent is enough. Um, yes, for an adult woman, of course it is. Uh, adult woman consent is not in the consent is only for minors. I think uh, uh, Dr. Aparna and Dr. Priya are answering a few of the questions there, and I think that should be great. I think we move on. Dr. Priya will take the next session. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope you um, please give your feedback to the feedback form. Dr. Priya, are you here? Hi, Dr. Basab. Hi. Yes. So nice to you. <laughs> How are you? Oh, yes, good. I'm here. I saw you powering through the rapid fire of questions. <laughs> but it's okay, but, uh, but you already you already tackled some of it. So it, it I had fun. tried to supplement with uh, typing, but uh, thank you so much for that uh, excellent session. I think that uh, you covered all points so well. Uh, I think this is a, a house full of experts and gynecologists. Yeah, Not yeah. Just needs to be there. It's more of like a revision. I think all of y'all have raised very valid points and very good questions. Uh, so with your permission, I will now take over for the next session. I hope y'all can see my slides. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Priya Karna, Technical Officer for Reproductive Health at the WHO Country Office for India. I'm extremely uh, happy and I take this opportunity to congratulate and thank not only my previous speakers, but also Foxy at large for supporting this very important initiative together with uh, WHO. Um, as you know, uh, the training today is really to ensure 
that all of you all, I think all 80 plus participants that are here today uh -huh. are empowered as master trainers. We hope that all the materials that are given to you, if there are any doubts, please do clarify. We want to make sure that uh, all of this uh, uh, is provided to you and you are able to take it in your own societies and in your own work to effectively uh, not only practice respectful abortion care yourselves, but also become the champions that we need in this country uh, to take this work forward. So having said that, uh, my session today is on uh, uh, safe abortion values, evidence and rights and respect, which is really the core of the respectful abortion care program. Uh, I think my previous speakers very nicely laid out uh, what the MPP rules are, what are the different technologies that are available for medical and surgical abortion. And I think before we go into understanding what to do after an abortion, it's very important that we take a few moments to really reflect upon our own values and how that affects women's access to uh, services, particularly abortion. In the session today, we will first uh, try to understand and define respectful abortion care, what the WHO standards are, and what do we really mean by this? Uh, I have a few standard videos and uh, presentation material that I will be giving to you all that you can use uh, on, in your own trainings or even in your own classes, for example. Some of you may be teachers and academics or educationists, and you might be able to use this with your students, with your junior residents, undergrads, senior residents, or even just people within your network to highlight how norms and stigma in this country affect services, particularly abortion services. Uh, I think that in the previous session, there were some questions about where can you find all of this material? And uh, I will give the link as well as show you all where all WHO documents related to medical methods of abortion, health workforce on uh, different aspects, as well as some additional documents that we have prepared, which we call as SAVER, which is Safe Abortion Values, Evidence and Rights. It's an entire toolkit. Uh, I'll give you the links to all of that, as well as show you some other uh, resources that are available as apps that you can now download. Uh, that are called the WHO MEC wheel, for example. So that's in the next hour, uh, half an hour or so, very quickly, uh, similar to what Dr. Basad did, I hope to be able to provide these resources to all of you. We'll start with what is respectful abortion care. I think all of you all have joined and we've been doing this for a while. What we really mean by respectful abortion care uh, is that you all are all familiar with uh, the respectful maternity care that came out uh, through the evidence on abuse and disrespect. Uh, respectful abortion care is really an extension of that. By way of definition, it means uh, care that maintains safety, dignity, confidentiality, ensures freedom from harm and mistreatment, enables informed choice, and provides continuous during and after any and all types of abortion. I think that you know, by way of its definition, it addresses some key issues that are incorporated in the law. Confidentiality is mandated by the MPP amendment. Freedom from harm and mistreatment is something that we as doctors have uh, committed to. Enabling informed choice is with more and more change in social aspects informed choice is more important than ever. And then of course, we are really moving towards a, a form of practice, a form of medical service now, where support, communication, being available for the client is very, very important. And abortion care is not different from any other service. It's the same. And really, we have to make sure that, you know, something that is so much of bias, so much of, well, is this the right thing? Is this the wrong thing? Should you do it? Should you not do it? Those are things that we really need to stay away from, and that's what respectful abortion care is. In simple terms, what it really means, like I said, is that you, either as a provider, as a patient, as somebody whose family member, girlfriend, anybody in your extended network might either need these services or needs or is providing this service. Either ways, should be treated with and treats the other person with dignity empathy and compassion. It should not matter whether you're rich, poor, ethnicity, gender, social status, caste, 
any amount of reproductive history, pregnancy, it doesn't matter if it's your third pregnancy, fourth pregnancy, you're 18 years old, 14 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 49 years old, should not matter. None of these things matter. All that matters is that any time that any client, uh, I wouldn't even say patient, it's really somebody who wants a service, is coming to us at that point, that point of care is provided respectfully. I think it's also equally important that you know, in India, we're in, in a social structure where uh, we've had a history of, you know, female feticide or preference of sun. There are several issues that can come up, but every opportunity or every interaction with the client is an opportunity to, uh, you know, educate or really listen to somebody. And if you feel that something isn't right, it's also important, equally important to speak up. As a, as a health professional, uh, I think uh, to, today as participants in this training, tomorrow as master trainers and uh, 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 you know, speakers uh, for other trainings, it's very important that we constantly communicate and constantly reiterate that communication is the key. We have to be able to not only listen and support, but also provide this communication effectively, respectfully. There's a short video uh, that we'll watch now uh, and that you all can also all use that just highlights uh, norms and stigma. I'll just reshare my screen so that you can uh, hear it as well. All right. So as part of respectful abortion care, like I said, very important to understand what our social norms are and what kinds of stigma exist. Social norms are the unwritten rules of behavior that are considered acceptable in a group or society. Norms can change according to the environment, situation and or culture in which they are found. People's behavior may also change accordingly. What are some examples of social norms? In times of COVID-19, there are new social norms that are considered COVID-19 appropriate behaviors like wearing a mask, maintaining social distance, and to wash or sanitize our hands regularly. An example of a social norm that we must follow at all times is to not use profanity in conversation, especially formal or official conversations or when talking to patients, clients. Now let's look at some examples of social norms around gender. Girls wear pink, boys wear blue. This is a gender stereotype. Girls and boys can choose to wear whatever color they like. Color has no gender. Men should be working, strong and not show emotion. Women should be caring and nurturing and stay at home. Men should work and make money. Women should take care of housework and children. There is no need for women to own or inherit property. Now let's look at a few examples of norms around sexual and reproductive health. Just as norms around gender are smaller aspects of some broader social norms, norms around sexual and reproductive health also trickle down from certain norms around gender. According to the WHO, good sexual and reproductive health implies that people are able to have a satisfying and safe sex life and that they have the capability to reproduce and the freedom to decide if, when and how often to do so. A woman should be married before getting pregnant and having children. Adolescent sexuality and premarital sex are unacceptable and immoral. Women are responsible for contraception. Now we see what is stigma. Stigma can be understood as a shared understanding that a person, a quality or circumstance is somehow morally unacceptable. What are examples of sexual and reproductive health stigma? A shared understanding that sex before marriage is morally wrong and or socially unacceptable. A girl who uses a contraceptive method 
is promiscuous and will have problems when she decides to get pregnant. A married woman is more deserving of contraceptives than an unmarried woman. A girl who has had an abortion is committing a sin and brings shame to her community. Having an abortion has long-term health effects and the woman's health will never recover to her pre-abortion state. Women who have had an abortion once would become habitual and avoid using contraception. It is important to understand that norms and stigma are different from laws and policies. For example, an unmarried girl seeking abortion is considered immoral due to stigma, whereas, as per law, sex-selective abortion is illegal in India. In this exercise, we explore how social norms and stigma influence access of reproductive health and rights, how people experience SRH stigma, the impact social norms and stigma have on our actions personally and professionally, and the impact they have on the actions of others, personally and professionally. So I hope uh, you all saw the video, enjoyed it. The idea of the video, which is a larger part of a larger training that we provide through WHO, is to not only be able to understand stigma and norms, but also understand that stigma and norms, things that we take for a fact or for given, actually perpetuate disrespect and abuse. For example, uh, and the, the things that we saw that women should do this and men should do this, or it's okay to get slapped, for example, if you've done something wrong. These are all types of abuse and that becomes a part of our lives and unknowingly or knowingly, we tend to internalize it and this affects our behavior. So just even starting to talk about it like we are doing now, starting to acknowledge, being aware of it. I think Foxy has taken a lot of effort. Foxy for All is a great initiative. Uh, the president has taken up the effort of uh, uh, propagating and talking about Dira, which is not uh, accepting violence, for example. Respectful abortion care is simply an extension of the same. Abuse, like physical abuse or verbal abuse or sexual abuse, these are overt abuses. These are things that we see and are immediately aware that we should not be doing them. However, it's really discrimination or second time abortion ke liye aaye, ab bhi dene ki kya zarurat hai? Or, oh, unmarried hai, does she really need this? Or, you know, these are small things uh, as providers, we might not be, uh, it might not be a conscious thing that we are doing, but sometimes the norms and situations around us may uh, force us or may have actually uh, made it almost internal. And that's what we need to be aware of. It takes practice, it takes consciousness, and it takes awareness that these things are not to be done. That's how we are able to bring about the change that we really want to see. Uh, I think WHO has also added a few more aspects towards uh, categories of disrespect and abuse. And I wanted to put this out there so that all of us take account, take stock. These slides will be with us. We remember them when we use them in our trainings. You all, all will our master trainers. When you start teaching them, when you start using them, these things, you know, they are, they cause a ripple effect. If every time we realize that abuse is not just physical, verbal, and sexual, but stigma, discrimination, failing to meet professional standards, not having a good rapport between the provider and the woman, not even having like health systems constraints that are not allowing us to do our job properly. All of these are some form of disrespect and abuse, and we need to be careful and cognizant of them. I think uh, Indian government has made a huge effort, and so has Foxy, by taking up respectful abortion care, amending the law. It's really up to us now that, you know, all the things that we talk about, the implementation nahi hota hai, service delivery mein issue hai, those are the things that we now take ownership of and ensure that these are not uh, something that we talk about in the next five or ten years. Um, if we look at what are the different aspects or specifically what constitutes as respectful abortion care, I wanted to break it down into 12 domains. This is a very well-established uh, uh, narrative. It has taken years of evidence uh, and research. It's all taken from the respectful maternity care, but I'm really happy that you know uh, with this partnership 
on RAC with Foxy India as the first country globally. You all are the first cohort of master trainers anywhere in the world to take up respectful abortion care. India already has uh, done the law change. It's really up to us now as providers, as people that will be, be taking this work forward to continuously talk about and reiterate what does respectful care really mean. It's, it doesn't only mean that you talk nicely to someone. It also means that you're ensuring that they, there is no harm. They are not mistreated. It's not just about you, but even people in your surroundings. If someone comes to the clinic and the provider is talking very properly, but the guard outside the uh, facility abuses that person, that is also mistreatment. That is also harm. So even though you're not doing it, somebody around you or somebody in your vicinity might be doing it. So as champions for respectful abortion care as master trainers as people who take this work forward it is up to us to not only ensure freedom from harm and mistreatment in our own actions but also in those that we teach those that we provide services to maintaining privacy and confidentiality again a big part of respectful abortion care this is mandated by law i think that there were questions about poxo uh, i think it's important to remember that by doing one thing, it's not necessary that we're doing everything. So for example, under 18, we should not deny services, but that does not mean that don't report in box. So still report it, but do it respectfully. Every woman deserves dignity and choice. We, we have to learn to respect other people's choices. I think in this fast culture of five minute attention span, where there's so many young people at any given point of time in India, there are about 250 million young people between the ages of uh, 10 to 19 years of age. They're just going to enter uh, the reproductive age. They, people are being more educated now. Girls are coming into the formal workspace. Reproductive freedom also means having reproductive choice. The ability to decide when and how many children you will have. And abortion has a very important part to play there. I think as providers, it's important that we engage with effective communication. It's not only about talking slowly or uh, softly, but it's also talking meaningfully. Like I said, every opportunity of interaction with a client is an opportunity to make a very big difference in somebody else's life. Cannot stress enough that you know, as a provider, maybe for you, this is the 100th patient or the 50th patient that day. But for that patient, you're the first and only person that day. And those remembering that, knowing that, and understanding that perspective matters a lot. Sometimes all we need to do is just take a moment, take a step back. We might not see 500 cases of abortion in a day. But whenever we do, just remember that this is a difficult choice, no matter what the reason is. And as a provider, we need to be able to respect that. Uh, consent, I think in India, uh, for, an, uh, for an adult or somebody who's a major above 18, years consent is not needed you don't need to be married you can be you can be from the lgbtq community anybody and that's what the law is mandating as providers we need to uphold that we need to ensure that that is actually realized and practiced in reality in real life uh, we have to be available for continuous access and support uh, while um, uh, abortion medicines per se cannot be given through telemedicine but at least seeing the patient, I think in during COVID, some very fantastic examples of being able to connect, being able to communicate with your clients, with patients in different areas and different localities through phone, through WhatsApp is there. And providing contraceptive support, providing guidance, providing just being there for somebody. It goes such a long way that as a lay person, as somebody who does not have access to a doctor, that client is able to say, well, I have my gynecologist on my phone. I can ask her whatever I want. She is available for me or he is available for me. And that is the kind of, uh, that is the level of uh, uh, relationship. That is the kind of uh, support that respectful abortion care really stands for. It is about ensuring good quality services, physical environment, or I would rather say virtual environment in these days, depending on the resources that you have. Uh, providing equitable abortion care in India in the public sector particularly is free, but it has to be provided with care. Just because it's something is free does not mean that you know free judgment can be given along with it. So free means free service, not free judgment. I think that is something that we have to constantly remember and practice. Uh, a lot of uh, y'all are uh, educators, teachers, 
uh, people that lot many students will look up to or rely on. You'll be using this in your own trainings. I think, again, I would like to reiterate that it's important that you try to uh, constantly educate as well as uh, make sure that your students, et cetera, are motivated. They feel confident to take this uh, respectful abortion care meaningfully in their own areas of work. I think we have a dedicated session on contraception and counseling, and I hope that the next, and you'll find actually that the next speaker really does that very well, and I'll leave it uh, for that there. Um, for those that want, and I promise this is my last slide before we go into some interactive session, uh, WHO has a dedicated three to four day training. We did it with the uh, association in Delhi uh, through All India Institute of Medical Sciences. But if those who are interested, we do have something called the Saver Toolkit itself. And uh, this here's a short video on the Saver Toolkit. For those that are interested following RAC, we would be happy to take it up. I do want to say that even respectful abortion care is really based on the four principles of Saver. Inform, which was what the MTP session was. Uh, in, in Explore, which is what the uh, uh, session on uh, contraceptive technology and updates was. Uh, engage, which is what respectful abortion care is to be able to give you videos. We have uh, games that people can play and come for sessions. I will share the links for that as well. And then, of course, equip, which is what the counseling session is. And while RAC, the training that we are doing now, is really a short, abridged version. We do have a much larger training, which is called the Saver uh, Toolkit. I'll show us a brief uh, one-minute video on that, and then we'll go into the last part of the session. <laughs> No woman should die due to an unsafe abortion, and when abortion is provided, it should be given in a legal and evidence-based manner with quality, safety, dignity, and respect. W no woman should die due to an unsafe abortion. And when abortion is provided, it should be given in a legal and evidence-based manner with quality, safety, dignity, and respect. WHO has a toolkit on safe abortion values, evidence, and rights, or WHO, which is a model-based training for doctors, nurses, health providers, program managers, and really anyone to assess our values, address our biases, and learn together to transform our attitudes towards respectful abortion care for anyone who needs it. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we adapted and converted the WHO Saver Toolkit into an innovative, gamified, hybrid version that you can do either in person, online, or as a combination with an expert trainer, or simply by playing one of the standalone games to learn from the comfort of your home. Saver has four modules, Engage, Inform, Explore, and Equip. In the Engage module, Participants review recent media stories from the country about gender, unintended pregnancy, the realities of safe and unsafe abortion, and juxtapose these with the global standard definitions. In the Inform module, participants share and discuss background information on SRHR, on safety of legal abortion, contraceptive prevalence, abortion incidence and safety, abortion law and safety, and achieving reproductive rights in the global and regional or local context. In the Explore module, participants will play various games and watch videos relating to gender, safe abortion, preventing unwanted pregnancy, explore social norms and values, and consider how these may be rooted in stigmatizing attitudes or contribute to stigma from a personal perspective. The Equip module is to promote knowledge of, interest in, and further use of WHO guidelines and tools, with a focus on guidelines and tools relevant to contraception, abortion, and post-abortion care, towards the many steps needed for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, also known as SDGs, Building Resilient Health Systems for Universal Health Coverage, or UHC, leaving no one behind. We must remember, quality and dignity of care matter as much as saving lives. SAVA is our small step towards SDG starting with ensuring safe abortion is provided with values, evidence, and rights or respect. 
So uh, that's about Savo. It's a, like I said, it's a larger toolkit. Uh, the video that you saw on uh, stigma and norms is a part of that. Similar to this, we also have another uh, video that I'll not show right now, but I'll leave it with you, which is a guide on avoiding stigmatizing language. Uh, there are two video games that you can play on with the help of a computer. You can pass it on to your students, to your nurses, to uh, junior residents, senior residents, anybody that you feel appropriate, and you can share these. These are all part of the RAC package that, uh, that will be given to you. So I encourage everybody to go through them, look at them, use them. Uh, and I hope that you will find that they are useful. And if you need any additional support or anything, as WHO, we are always here. And we would be happy to uh, continue this conversation and provide support. I think I'll take a pause here to just highlight that with the help of the MPP law change, now the momentum is there. Uh, the, the, the support, the legal support that is needed is there. As Foxy, you all are the largest provider base, not only in India, but anywhere uh, as one single platform. And through these online trainings and this material, I know that we don't have enough time to really go over everything in detail, but y'all are all experts. All you need is the right resources and the right tools to be able to become real champions. And that's what this is really about, to be able to highlight what the key issues are, to uh, say that, you know, whether it is medical methods of abortion usage, using MBA instead of BNC, uh, making sure that every client is an opportunity, talking about respect, making sure that there is no PCP and DT conflation, reporting on BOXO correctly, uh, providing right contraception, all of these things in all aspects of your life. What we want to ensure is that, you know, respect, safety, dignity, quality, they become such a natural part of your everyday work that, you know, uh, clients and people don't complain or don't say that, you know, this is not some law to badal gaya, lekin uska, uska follow up kya hua. Such a thing, we hope that together we can ensure that that doesn't happen. We already know that as one provider, our role is more important than ever, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, as one provider who needs to provide services of counseling, contraception, referral, all the way up to 20 weeks, whether it is to provide vulnerable women care, like was shared in the first session, or to prioritize confidentiality, safety, all of these aspects. It's really important to remember that respect really begets respect. Unless you give respect, you cannot expect that respect will be given to you. Or if, if you're expecting, that is not something that, that should be a given. So I hope with all of that, we all remember that India in the 1970s, really 50 years ago, uh, moved uh, towards making unsafe abortion illegal. They moved towards making, 1971 was when uh, the safe abortion law was first, MPP was first passed. It was in 2000s, really almost 30 years later, that rules were formed under safe abortion. And we moved from unsafe to safe abortion. And 20 years from that, is today when we are actually moving from uh, safe abortion to respectful abortion. And I hope that you all have all the resources and tools that you need. I had put it in the chat box that it's available at srhr.org. These slides will be available with you. Uh, I'll also share the links of the two video games that I talked about. These can all be played anywhere on the computer, not yet on the phone, but uh, please do do it. Try to understand how these things that we don't really talk about very often in medicine or in medical practice are things that actually uh, affect our services. I'll pause here. If anybody has any particular questions, please feel free to ask me now. You can ask in the chat box or ask. If not, then what I'll do is quickly go over three questions. I uh, urge everybody to participate. You can write your answer in the chat box. These are simply yes or no questions. And uh, just a quick follow up on everything that I talked about in the last uh, 20 minutes of a half hour or so to see and to just check our values and see where we are at. All right, my first question, uh, according to WHO, restricting access reduces the number of unsafe abortions. Just by a quick chat, yes or no. Let's see what people think. Yes, no, true, false. Want to hear from all of you. What do you think? Whether 
WHO's definitions, everything that we've learned so far, does it say restricting access reduces the number of unsafe abortions? All right, I see a lot of false. I see a few yes. I see a few true, mostly false. Let's give it a few more seconds. All right, thank you everyone for your answers. Let's see what the right answer is. Answer is false, no. WHO does not talk about restricting or providing access. That is something which is within the mandate of the country. The country's laws and policies govern access. Thankfully in India, the law is very wide open, very flexible, it's really in the interest of women. WHO defines safety of abortions. What we say is whether uh, the appropriate method, the appropriate trained person, whether the appropriate place is there or not, when criteria are met or not. WHO's role in setting is in setting standards and norms. As providers, what we have to be cognizant of is WHO does not tell you what to do or what not to do. It just tells you what the right thing should be. What to do or what not to do is both a personal choice as well as a, a decision that is governed by law. So thank you for everybody for participating in that. Let's look at the next question. The MTP amendment 2021 requires that a minor less than 18 years should obtain written consent from parents or guardians before she can go undergo a termination of pregnancy. Again, a minor needs to get a written consent from parent or guardian before she can undergo a termination of pregnancy. Wow. True, mostly true. I think I must thank OnePlus because I only I can see OnePlus name in that who said false because, and Dr. Indra Bhati, I guess, I'm just seeing the last one, so not by taking any names, but I think we should all go back to the first module. I think I had answered this question in chat also. The consent is by a legal guardian or somebody who can give consent. It does not have to be a parent. That's why it's there. So that, you know, we actually remember that as, an, as somebody who's under 18 years of age, POXO reporting needs to be there, but it does not have to be a parent. That is actually a barrier. If you're telling somebody who's a minor to get consent from somebody that they are really scared of, then it's actually creating a hindrance to service. So the MTP amendment says that you need the consent of a guardian. The uh, uh, definition of guardian as defined by the rules is very, very flexible. Uh, anybody above the age of 18, as long as it does not put you as a provider at risk, asking for a parent's consent should not be something that we should ask for. It should be just somebody who is able to give that consent. It can be an older friend, it can be anybody. So basically, I think somebody has also written about any adult, and that's right. Any adult can give that. Uh, remember that as a minor, as somebody who's very young, uh, there may be so many different circumstances or situations. Even uh, the 20 to 24 weeks extension considers a minor as a vulnerable group. And that's why that extension is there also, that the mandate for uh, putting, and I think that there's a very good question that who is a guardian? It's not for you as a provider to decide who the guardian is. Let it come from the client, let it come. That is what truly client-driven service, patient-centric care really means. Let them come with it. Your job is to advise them, tell them that you need consent of an 18 plus. You need somebody who can take responsibility for this so that as a provider, you're not at risk. But as it could be a sibling, it could be a cousin, it could be anybody. Doesn't need to be a parent. In that way, you might actually be putting somebody at risk. Again, this is just something to say that even after so much of so many sessions, sometimes, you know, we, we listen to things, we, uh, we are attentive, but not really imbibing them. And these small nuanced things are very, very important. So I'd really urge everybody to go back to the sides, 
see what the uh, rules are, see what the law says, so that you're safeguarding yourself, but also, uh, you know, not asking for the wrong thing uh, inadvertently, not doing it knowingly, for example. All right, this is my last one. 30-year-old uh, woman, recently widowed, wants to get an abortion at 22 weeks. As a provider, it's your responsibility to tell her to continue this pregnancy. All right, I see no, 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 false, false, no, no, no. Okay, so I feel like through this particular session on uh, values, we've come to a point where we all agree that as a provider, we, it's not our place or our responsibility to tell them what to do or what not to do. What we should be focusing on is providing them the right counseling, telling them, maybe trying to understand their uh, situation. If you see the MTP rules, uh, it has the vulnerable population category includes recently widowed or uh, 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 person, somebody who might be vulnerable. So it's really, you know, I think that there's a question on in terms of risk. Okay. So basically these questions I wanted to put out there so that they give you some flavor of different kinds of situations that might come that might be there that knowingly or unknowingly creates a bias. What we have to always remember is that remember that our own value system, what we think is right or wrong is not something that we need to enforce or need to tell somebody else what is medically right might not be socially right might not be personally right there is so much of nuance and complexity and interaction uh, all we need to remember and practice is that in india abortion is legal we have to make it safe we have to make it respectful and as providers as master trainers really today's session and all of the sessions that we are doing is creating you all as master trainers, creating you all as uh, the flag bearers of this value system that we hope gets passed on to not only the next generation of providers, but to a legacy of providers that will continue in the practice for many, many years to come that practice bias-free, respectful care for all. So that's my session. If there are any questions, uh, happy to do so. If you would like to uh, ask anything, please raise your hand. You introduce yourself and you can ask a question. If not, that's my time. So maybe we'll wait for a few minutes to see if there are any questions from anybody. Uh, I'll put the links to the games, uh, but I will also put uh, these slides will be available to all of you because uh, the, uh, the videos are a little bit heavy. Uh, I, I would request that all of you download it from the link and keep it uh, on your uh, um, uh, phones. And, if you need, I, and the other thing that I usually like to do, I, I like to download them and put them on my WhatsApp so that if videos are needed, I can forward them to people. So feel free to do so. And if you need any support or any help, we are here. Uh, no, that was a wonderful job done, Priya. Thank you so much. I, I don't see any more questions coming in. I don't know if Aparna is still around. To... Uh, I think Dr. Aparna is not there, but uh, if you want, I can introduce the next speaker and welcome or... That would be awesome. Uh, and uh, uh, just before you get on with the next speaker, I just wanted to urge all the participants here. Uh, those couple of questions which Priya had put down at the end of her presentation. Now, those are some of few of them which have been picked up from the pre-test and uh, subsequent post-test. So when you're giving your post-test, do uh, refer to the uh, discussions that we have had in the earlier presentations. And uh, we are hopeful that you'll be able to reply to them uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the form that you have understood them very well. Thank you so much. Over to you, Priya. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jay, and thank you for that. Just quickly before I introduce my very esteemed next speaker, uh, let me take a moment to tell you all that the uh, two games, Cross the Line and Personal Compass, uh, the links have been put in the chat. You can play, you can download, you can use it. 
Uh, I think uh, somebody also mentioned that they did not get the links to the pre-test and post-test. Uh, after the next session, when um, Stajay, he will show the operational plan and teach you how to do these sessions on your own. The links to the sessions will always or will also be there. You'll get your certificate as a master trainer for having completed this uh, training. Once you are able to, once you uh, uh, once the sessions are over, only after you take the uh, post test. So with that, I would like to now invite Professor Krishnendu Gupta. I see him here. Sir is a very fine speaker, has taken several other sessions on respectful abortion care, needs no introduction, but it is my pleasure and privilege to invite him here uh, to have the last session of the day to talk about the importance of counseling. I've heard him talk in several other sessions. He's a fantastic speaker. It's a privilege to now invite you for the next session and ha I hand it over to you to continue the conversation on pre and post abortion uh, family planning counseling. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Priya. And I think uh, we must uh, really congratulate uh, FOGSI and WHO, especially uh, Dr. Shanta Kumari, our president, to have taken this up very strongly. In, you know, and uh, we heard three brilliant presentations so far by Professor Aparna, Dr. Basab, and Dr. Priya. And of course, it will be followed by another very interesting presentation on the operation plan. And I have uh, the job of going through with you uh, the importance of pre and post abortion family planning counseling. What basically is leveraging the technology for referrals and online consultations. And we have had lovely sessions and it's been a learning experience for me as well. So when we talk about counseling, what is counseling? Counseling is a structured interaction in which a person voluntarily receives emotional support. That's very important voluntarily receives emotional support and guidance from a trained person. And that's what we are doing. We are training each other in an environment that is conducive to open sharing of thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. So it is not a one-way monologue. It has to be a dialogue. We have to be active listeners as well. So why is pre and post abortion counseling? It's, you know, it's, so important for us to discuss because it is an integral part of the comprehensive abortion services. It is as important as the procedure itself. There are many procedures, but it's as important as the procedure. This will also help, our counseling will also help women or the concerned woman to, uh, you know, to make a decision as to what are the uh, you know, kind of procedures that she can opt for and whenever needed, not always, but whenever needed. And it's always nice that the spouse should also be counseled. So therefore there is a important decision amongst the family, amongst the couple itself. So the critical role of pre-procedural counseling are three helps and one ensure. What are the three helps? It helps the woman to decide about termination of pregnancy. It helps the woman to choose the method of termination. It helps a woman to adopt a contraceptive method and ensures the delivery of complete information about the procedure so that you are clear and the lady involved is also clear what she's getting into, what she should do, what she should not do. So it's very clear pre-procedure counseling is extremely important and critical. The procedure basically helps and ensures privacy and confidentiality very important. We must be non-judgmental and be sensitive. I think Dr. Priyakarna has mentioned it on numerous occasions that we have to be non-judgmental. This also establishes a rapport between the doctor or the caregiver and the lady. We must use simple language and allow the woman to clarify her doubts. That means not only we must avoid medical jargon, but also allow her to speak. And if she has made up her mind for termination of pregnancy, we must, we must assess that with which procedure she is you know, kind of uh, good for or you know, what is good for her. It is also important to mention to them because sometimes there are these myths. What about fertility? So there is quick return of fertility following the procedure. There is, you, know, you give opportune time for the contraceptive acceptance. 
and we must tell them that there must be at least a minimum of six gaps between this, this abortion, uh, you know, this procedure and the next pregnancy. And we must also mention the health benefits and the future pregnancy outcomes even following, uh, you know, uh, following a contraceptive kind of device uh, till, uh, or a contraceptive method rather, I should use the uh, terminology for following this abortion. And it has been proved that 90% of abortion related maternal mortality can be prevented by ensuring proper and you know, kind of adequate contraception. So when do we start? The counseling should start at the first visit or during the consultation, except of course, when there is some kind of grief and you know, it, which, which you can actually delay it. But it's important that we must tell them about the return of fertility you know, which can occur within 10 days to four weeks following the procedure, help with the choices which are available, method specific counseling, each method which will come to at a later time. And, you know, if there is kind of high risk behavior, which, which one will be better for them. But if a woman is not willing for any contraceptive method, please do not refuse the termination. We have to try and counsel her after the procedure. And even if she's not willing to, uh, you know, follow up, we have to follow up in a week's time and then further counsel her. So it's not, so it's very important that we must not refuse the termination when someone has come for the termination, but not very clear or not very happy or not very sure about following a contraceptive method, even after your counseling. So what are the general guiding rules to assess suitability for post abortal count contraception? The abortion has to be complete. You must ensure that. There's obviously no existing infection, no injury to the genital organs. And of course, the ch chance of fresh pregnancy has to be ruled out if she comes to you after a gap following the previous abortion. And a critical role of post-procedural counseling is that it ensures that the woman has understood the precautions and care needed during the immediate post-abortion period. It also gives you an opportunity to counsel for contraception in case these are the few women who have not previously accepted. And finally, it also reinforces the need for continuing the use of contraceptive method chosen. So there has to be compliance and we are very important here as trainers to ensure that the caregivers counsel them enough that they continue the contraceptive method, otherwise come back to you pregnant again. So continue, reassure, repeat. What do we continue? We continue to ensure privacy and confidentiality. We reassure her in case of any problems and we repeat the information about post-procedural care and the danger signs, like if there's foul swelling, discharge or excess bleeding, I think, which goes beyond the scope of you know, presentation here to the erudite uh, delegates. So what about counseling? What about this post-abortion I mean, post uh, family planning counseling? If she's already opted for it, you must appreciate. Give, say some kind words. Immediate care, of course, intrauterine device, uh, if you give her the injectable medroxyprostone acetate, ongoing like oral pills, tell her what are the follow-up protocols, uh, the continuity, you know, there must be continuum and continuity of the, of the procedure. And of course, there are certain areas where we have cue cards where, you know, you can show them the cue cards regarding all the contraceptive uh, methods which are available. Now, if they're undecided, there has to be some kind of anxiety in the patient or in the lady due to which she is allay, uh, which she is not taking it. So you have to allay their anxiety. You have to give them the importance of immediate adoption and choose it. What about the extended period of adoption of that choice? Couple counseling, as I mentioned, preferably to be done. And we must highlight about the emergency contraceptive pills because they are, of course, widely now advertised in the, in the media itself, but you have to tell them that when someone takes, I always you know, make it a point that if a patient comes to me and says that they've taken three emergency contraceptive pills in a month, that means there's a problem. So they have to follow some kind of uh, routine contraception. Once in a while is okay, but not three in a month. You have to also tell them how you know, their periods can go absolutely haywire if they take three to four uh, emergency contraceptive pills in a month. So this following few slides is going to take you through the various contraceptive methods which are available 
All of us are well aware of it. Each and every one of you watching this, we are aware about the barrier methods and condoms. In the, you know, in the first, following a first trimester uh, abortion, well, when they can use it, second trimester, when they can use it, and of course, some additional information. And I think about the condom, what's the most important is, it's the prevention against the STIs, including HIV. And I, it also enables men the responsibility to take contraception. Intrauterine contraceptive device, the IUDs as it's called, we can insert it immediately or up to 12 days after the confirmation of completed abortion using uh, the medical methods. And even in the second trimester, the same thing. And of course, rule out the contraindications. What is important is if you use the um, copper 388 can give a long-term contraception, reversible contraception for up to 10 years. And again, they have a lot of questions on this as if they remove it, will the fertility come immediately? And you have to mention that, yes. And it can be provided by trained doctors, AMs, nurses, et cetera. And I think it's uh, extremely important to mention those who have got little, you know, these kind of things about hormonal side effects, they obviously have no uh, hormonal side effects. Also, they have a worry that the threads can give rise to some sort of a problem to the male while having penetrative intercourse, uh, penetrative sex. So I think you have to mention it that there is no interference with sex at all. Um, and th these are something where the counseling is important. Combined oral pills, I think we have spoken enough about it. We can start them uh, you know, uh, immediately or up to seven days uh, after both first trimester, second trimester abortion. But what is more important is as primary care physicians, we have to talk about more about the non-contraceptive benefits of hormonal contraceptives also. We just talk about contraceptives and leave it, but no, we know about the protection against ectopic pregnancy, endometrial ovarian CA, and uh, you know, benign breast diseases, et cetera. And I think it's very important about it regula regulating menstrual cycles, reducing the amount of blood loss, the mean blood loss also. So, so many benefits are there, improves acne, hirsutism. I mean, there's no end to it, but we don't often, we do not speak about them. And I think it's extremely important that we do. Well, long-term injectables like the medroxyprostone acetate injection, it also can be used within, you know, immediately or after seven days or up to seven days after the abortion in both the first or the second trimester uh, uh, methods. But what is important is in addition to mentioning that it's highly effective and you know all the things that have been put, put forward here and the same kind of benefits, the non conservative benefits, the, it has no estrogenic side effects. And that's one of the very important point and it has no effect on the quality or quantity of breast milk. That's also important but tell them that initially there could be some kind of a menstrual kind of an issue, few spots here and there. And I think that's very important that you have to tell them about it, which I think from our side is important for them to tell. Well, uh, permanent uh, methods of sterilization, female and of course, uh, vasectomy. These are things which we are well aware of. And you have to tell them that once done, the, you know, normally, you know, the way we all love to do it because we do not want another pregnancy following a female, you know, tubectomy coming on, you know, on your name. So we really take a good chunk of the tube. So uh, we don't like to, you know, it's high, you know, there's really very uh, less chance for a recanalization and stuff like that. And also with IVF now, uh, the tubal factor is almost, you know, taken, taken away. Vasectomy, I think the most important thing is to counsel them for the males to agree. Uh, because they feel that they're going to lose their you know, virility and things like that, but also it's important to counsel. I think this is the most difficult part in our country to, to do as far as counseling for vasectomy and hats off to those who do them uh, you know, really effectively. So this is just give, you know, gives you the, you know, following the uh, me, you know, medical methods of abortion, we can start as early as three days for the, you know, the combined oral contraceptives, injectables, centromon, et cetera. And of course, uh, let's say that, uh, you know, the intrauterine device uh, can also be started from the, let's say after two weeks or so. Uh, well, uh, following the vacuum aspiration, they can be started quite early, all of them, as you can see. And uh, well, uh, it's important for us to know that most of them we can start any of the methods that are available rather quickly. So this is something I think most of us already knew, but what COVID taught us is teleconsultation. It's not that it was not there before, but I think the rampancy of the usage of the teleconsultation is extremely important for us. 
That is not only teleconsultation, telecounseling, teleguidance, telereference, and of course, linkages through the uh, technology that we have. And I think uh, doc the patients, uh, our own patients nowadays are reluctant to you know, come over to your clinic when they can get a quick consult over, over your, you know, your uh, um, FaceTime or WhatsApp video, et cetera, or on your Skype. So there are a lot of uh, technologies which are, you know, which are available like Hamdo on the website, Astanu, YouTube is, you know, there's ample amount of kind of uh, information. You have cue cards, infographics, there are helplines. And what is even more important is the education platforms that the patients now have access to due to, let's say, WHO, Ministry of uh, Family Health and Family Welfare, the RCOG, ACOG, RANSCOG, all of them have excellent kind of, uh, you know, educative material that we have where they are quite, you know, uh, they, are, they are very, most of your patients now are tech savvy. Most of them have a mobile phone, so they, they know what to do and you can just give them the site, they'll go and kind of read up. So what about the SWOT analysis of teleconsultation? That is the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The strength, obviously, COVID, as I said, has taught us the importance of, uh, of technology, teleconsultation. Uh, well, uh, you know, you, you can talk through, uh, you know, the confidence is there and awareness, you know, spread out questions. You can answer at ease like all the three previous speakers have been doing. You can answer it on the chat box while even I'm speaking. Some queries of the previous speaker is being answered by Dr. Priya, I'm sure. And so it's like that. So you, there's no hurry. The weakness is, of course, there's no face-to-face -face, uh, kind of meeting. And I think there is a, you know, kind of an importance of face-to-face -face meeting because as being doctors, you know, we are all dying to meet our friends in our conferences. So I think face-to-face -face meeting is also an imp important and we cannot really demonstrate a procedure effectively. Let's say you want to show how an IUCD is inserted. So all these things are difficult to get a real 3D picture uh, on, on, on uh, you know, through the phone or through Skype. Well, opportunity is, you know, there's privacy and comfort in a closed room. It's not in a busy OPD where they're so scared to tell you things in front of someone. You know, in all our, most of our busy OPDs, you find someone is more interested to hear what the other person is saying rather than tell their own problem. Of course, it's cost saving and definitely the number of visits, you know, it cuts down. We have seen with our own antenatal patients, there was a time where we never saw even one of our antenatal patients during the late, you know, the mid and late 2020. We just couldn't, we couldn't go out. So obviously certain things are possible. Babies were still delivering. So there is an opportunity here to cut down visits, but the threat is always you have a missed opportunity to counsel them effectively. And yes, misdiagnosis. There is that very, very rare odd chance where you can actually make a, make a mistake and then, well, you can be taken to task for that. So the applicability of the components of uh, respectable abortion care, of course, assessment, you have to confirm the diagnosis, talk about the contrast that are required, counseling is extremely important, and follow up both, as I just told you, hybrid services, that is both the kind of teleconsultation as, as well as one of the uh, threats or uh, the, um, the, sorry, uh, you know, one of the things which is not possible with teleconsultation, uh, which is uh, the face-to-face. Uh, -face. So, you know, uh, so hybrid services, single visit can be done. And of course, with the uh, medical uh, methods of uh, abortion, three visits usually are required, uh, you know, which you can really cut it down as well. But to, to, uh, to ensure that, you know, the, the uh, abortion is complete, we have to have these visits to, to make sure that then we can actually safely give them the contraception. So to wind up, the key messages of this presentation is that the post abortal family planning council is extremely important and therefore there is a need for it. So when we counsel both, the couple, we bring them on board and we strive for 100% coverage. We capitalize on the basket of contraceptive methods that are available and apply and, uh, you know, kind of to the post abortal period. Technology, as far as possible, definitely has improved our, you know, scope uh, for counseling in the, in the area of respective um, abortion care or the comprehensive abortion care that we need to call it. But there is a concern as well 
with policies, malpractice, service costs, and access. Access, I think, is very important. It's not only have to be you know, available, but it has to be affordable too. And adolescent uh, you know, health needs both online and offline kind of uh, counseling, as well as uh, you know, therapy and treatment for uh, their, you know, uh, for the services that we have to provide for them. Because I think this adolescent period is, you know, there were questions about whether you need a guardian or a parent to, you know, so when they come to you, they come to you with a lot of confidentiality. You know, they expect a lot of confidentiality. And I think it's our duty to ensure that and not make, you know, as uh, Dr. Priya Karna was saying, judgmental, which cannot be judgmental. Even if they have multiple, you know, sexual partners, it's our job to tell them that, okay, if you have multiple sexual partners, these could be the issues which you have to be careful about. Are they using, are your partners using, you know, condoms? Because more than pregnancy, you can also get STIs, HIV. So these are some of the things which we have to be extremely, you know, kind of careful about and very, very nicely in their language, in the way they would like to hear, be empathetic towards them and work on them. And I think because they are the future. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And of course, we go on now to the operation plan. And of course, remind you about the post-test that is there and the feedback, which you will all have to uh, you know, fill up. So I think uh, if there are any questions, I would love to answer. But I think uh, Mr. Ajay Bharadwaj will also be waiting because it's already 5.40, 10 minutes past the time. So thank you again for the opportunity. And I'm really grateful to Foxy and WHO for you know, giving me this honor. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Krishnendu. It was a, uh, absolutely forceful, a very persuasive talk. And you, know, you made a routine subject actually come alive. Uh, you know, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to listen to you and hear what you have to say with all thank of you this. Very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, walk you through the uh, operational bit and uh, share my screen. Yeah, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is the operational plan and how and what of it in terms of how do you take this entire process forward, having understood the technicalities as well as the, uh, you know, the, the program related aspects, uh, both from the management point of view and as well as from ensuring a respectful abortion care. Uh, to talk about that, uh, Firstly, I would like to, okay, this one doesn't show up. Never mind. Uh, what we are trying to do here is trying to achieve and scale up this entire program across 262 societies, uh, almost uh, 37,000 members, uh, which you must be aware of. And uh, we are in the process of having created 500 master trainers and each one of you, 80 earlier, and now about 70 of you are still here, uh, will be part of this entire initiative uh, as we go forward as master trainers. A bit about the training session itself. Uh, we will urge and request each society to hold your own RSC online training program. Uh, through which you will be orienting all the FOXI members. And we are expecting that this should be completed latest by April, 2022, because that's the period that we have an agreement with uh, WHO that we need to complete this uh, entire process by then. So reach out and go back to your societies and uh, try to see how this thing can be operationalized and arranged ASAP so as to meet this uh, entire target that we have. The PowerPoint presentations, the same are ready as you can see, and they have to be used as is 
without any changes, additions or deletions, and they will be provided to you no sooner you arrange your society program and share with us the date and time for the same. You can introduce yourself verbally as you have seen today and do not add any slide for the same. Once the training date and time is fixed, let us know and we will arrange for the master trainers for your society. Uh, from the pool of master trainers, almost about 350 of you all uh, at the end of uh, the entire master training program. And uh, if, if, if you do not have your own society person as a master trainer, we will be happy to allocate a national trainer for you. And two trainers are expected to complete the entire training program going forward. Running the training session itself, one national observer will be present who will not be participating in conducting the session. You yourself have to do it in terms of, you know, uh, presenting the topic using your own slides and also adhering to the timing of the topic which has been allocated. There is no change should be done in the sequence of the agenda as you have seen today. Uh, each PowerPoint section of the topics should be covered as is what has been displayed today and presented today. Do allow time for taking questions either at the end of your presentation or at the end of all the completion of all the sessions. Ensure that you keep informing the colleagues that you know, registration and pre-test, post-test and feedback are compulsory for certification. Registration and pre-test you have already completed, each one of you. And that is the reason why you are here in this TOT program. Post-test and feedback will follow at the end of the session. I'll talk about that in a bit. Honorariums, please note this. Honorariums are allocated for every master trainer who is going to carry out the program in your respective societies or any other society where we call upon you to carry out that session. So make note of that. Uh, you will be receiving at the end of uh, you having conducted the program, you will receive an email requiring your account, bank account details because one of the agreements with WHO is all on radiums have to be paid online only. So there won't be any exchange of cash. There won't be any exchange of uh, checks either. So our office will be reaching out to you. Please take that mail as a genuine mail because copies of that mail will be marked to me as well as to Foxy office. So you know it's coming from a genuine source and you can go ahead and share that. Uh, another very interesting part about this program is all societies are eligible uh, for participation and receipt of an honorarium as well, uh, which would be taking care of any incidental and operational costs, if at all, they have to incur while you know, uh, running this program in your respective societies. So please do inform your society presidents and secretaries, if none of you are present here, that this also will be coming to each one of you. Uh, the best mode of communication to us and with us is through email. I do know there is a propensity to use WhatsApp. And at the end of the session, a lot of you people will be asking for our numbers. Uh, we don't mind sharing our numbers, but we are very poor with responses on WhatsApp because there are too many groups happening and too much of you know, good and junk is coming in. So many times I'm not paying attention to WhatsApp at all. So email and is, is the best way to reach out to us, foxy.racetraining2021 at gmail.com. And be rest assured, your mails will be responded as soon as possible. Our turnaround time is maximum half an hour to maximum four to five hours. And you will be receiving a mail from us, that, that is for sure. Zoom, please fix the date and time and inform us. Uh, we will be preparing the Zoom link and sharing that with you. And that Zoom link thereafter, you can share it with all your colleagues who are desirous of participating and being part of learning about what RAC is all about and what the amendments are all about. Uh, we will open the Zoom on the day of the call and you are free to then uh, you know, participate in that and take the session forward. But do remember uh, with every Zoom uh, link which is provided, any participant who has to join in has to submit 
and register into this entire thing. You have to present your own slides and make sure uh, you know the uh, screen share facility will be provided to you by the backend team. I need to reiterate here again, registration pretest, which you have already done. That's the reason why each one of you are here. Post-test and feedback is something which will come to you at the end of the session and certificates will be awarded to all participants who have completed all of these four, including and importantly, having attended this complete session. Please do also note that uh, no sooner the session ends and for any reason for internet or anything happening, you do not get the pop-up which says to continue and solve the post-test and feedback, give the feedback, do not worry and do not immediately get you know, concerned that you have not received it and what is happening. An email will follow with the link subsequently also to give opportunities to people who have not been able to complete it at the end of the session uh, today. Uh, so that's where we are. And uh, I'll be happy to you know, take some questions or if you have any operational things that in, in, in bothering you or in your mind, and I'm happy to take them. Uh, so in India, as we know, abortion is legal. Therefore, it's our collective responsibility to make it safe and respectful. Thank you very much, each one of you, for a patient hearing and for joining us today. And interestingly, today is uh, the second last TOT for the entire program. And I don't think so. We'll be having any more TOTs going forward. Uh, and uh, uh, on that note, I am also delighted to inform you that so far in the month of towards the end of January and till now, we have completed 17 RAC programs across the country of which six of them, or sorry, five of them have been TOTs and your, your program today is the fourth in the queue. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have and thank you very much. I don't think so anybody has any questions, which is a good thing to know. This is what you will see when you leave the meeting today. When you leave the meeting today, a pop-up will come, which will look something like this. You have to click on continue to be able to access the short survey, which includes the post-test and the feedback. I hope everybody is clear on this. If you're clear, you can please put it in the chat box as yes, yes, yes. If not, I can repeat myself again. Can we have some responses in the chat box that you have, you're clear about it? Perfect, that's good to know. So on that happy note, uh, Priya, are you still there? Or we'll call the meeting to a close? Okay, maybe Priya has stepped out and so has Aparna. Aparna, are you there? No, Aparna has also stepped out. That's, uh, that's fine. Uh, so thank you very much, each one of you. Let's take this mission and vision of our president, WHO, as well as each one of who's working for the cause of the woman and take this respectful abortion care project forward. And please bear in mind, Honorariums are applicable for the master trainers and for your society to take it forward. Plan your meetings ASAP, share the details with us, and we need to reach out to maximum number of Foxians by end of April. On that note, thank you each one of you for joining in today. All the very best, have a lovely evening, and we are available on email to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Ramesh, if you're still there, uh, as I mentioned, once you fix up the date and time of your meeting and your program, uh, at that point in time, the PPTs will be shared with everyone concerned there. Parneet, uh, stopping any kind of counter sales of MTP kit is not within the purview or in the scope of what we have been discussing here. 
the scope of it lies somewhere else and we are not responsible or accountable for it. I do understand that there's a concern. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. I'm leaving the meeting now.
doctor please leave the meeting doctors if you are not receiving a link uh, sorry a post session feedback message we'll we'll send a link to your mail id